Loving Father, we thank you for your word. May it be a word which directs our lives to your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please do be seated. You cannot be serious. Me and me mates have worked all day and you go and pay those fellas who have only worked for one hour exactly the same as us. There's no need to get shirty with me. I paid you exactly what you agreed. That was a con. If I'd known, if we'd known that we'd get a day's wage for working only one hour, do you think we'd have, have toiled all day in this heat? You tricked us. In many ways, I sympathize with these men who had worked all day under the baking sun and were, and were paid exactly the same as the men who worked only one hour, and that one hour in the cooler late afternoon. I can understand why they felt cheated, which makes this a very strange story, a very strange parable. What was and what is the point, the moral point of this story? What was Jesus trying to tell his followers then? And what is this parable trying to tell us now? Perhaps the story is trying to tell us to look at things in the long term. So if we say, let's say the men lived for 50 years, then those who worked the eight-hour day worked for naught point naught naught one eight percent of their lives. Whereas those who worked for only one hour worked for naught point naught 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 two percent of their lives. Not such a huge difference. Still, if I'd been sweating all day for the same wage as someone who worked only the last hour of the day, I'd not be too happy. Even if the terms of my a whole, even if in terms of my whole life, the difference was not really significant. But somehow, I don't think that's the point of the parable. Perhaps we might gain some insight if you look at what prompted Jesus to tell this strange story. And if you look back into what we now label the previous chapter, added later to aid our reading, as were the verse numbers, if you go back a little bit, we find a person asking Jesus what he must do to have eternal life. And Jesus tells him to sell all his possessions and give the money to the poor. Now, whilst this may or may not be a universal command, Jesus' advice to this man tells us that Jesus knew where this person's priorities lay. His heart was focused on his wealth. Jesus then followed this command to his questioner with these words to his disciples. Truly, I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. These words, words which ran counter to the culture then and which run counter to the culture now, after all, isn't it the rich who have or can get everything? But this truth that Jesus spoke provoked Peter to ask, Look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Now isn't Peter a wonderful character? Always the first to jump in, sometimes literally, and usually without pausing to consider his actions or his words. Peter acts and speaks straight from his heart. So Peter blurts out, Look, we have left everything for you. What then will we have? And we can feel Peter's pain in those words. He has left a steady job as a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, that is as steady as any fisherman's job is, to follow Jesus. He's left his family 
and most of his friends to follow Jesus. He's left his community and his home to follow Jesus. For the past however many years, he has lived off the hospitality of strangers, eating their food, sleeping in their homes, that is, when not sleeping under the stars. Look, said Peter, we have left everything and have followed you. What then will we have? Jesus goes on to tell Peter and his fellow, fellow disciples in somewhat poetic imagery what they will have and then Jesus goes on to generalize his response to Peter's pain. Jesus said, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. It's this episode, these questions, this conversation that prompts Jesus to tell this strange parable. Remember, the men who had toiled all day to receive their wage, a wage which I hope was sufficient to meet their, bill, their bills for them and their family. And the men who had worked but one hour at the end of the day received their wage, a wage which I hope was sufficient to meet their bills for them and their family. All the men employed that day received what they needed, what they needed that day to sustain them and their families. All the men had exactly what they needed. In the ways of the world, perhaps not what they wanted or felt they should have, but they had all that they needed that day. So the point of this strange story may be that the, that the past isn't everything. It doesn't matter what you have given up or when you have given it up. What you have now is all that matters. When, when Peter blurted out, what then will we have? His answer was, what you have now is what you now need. What Peter, ha what Peter had at that moment was his wage, his payment, his reward. No matter what we may have left, or when we left it, our wage, our payment, our reward is what we have now. When we begin our journey seeking to harmonize our wills with God's will, that journey is, and of itself, our reward. That reward is eternal life. The life that the man who questioned Jesus wanted the life that Jesus promises to everyone who turns from the ways of this fallen world to seeking God's will for them and for this world. So perhaps the parable is telling us that if we are seeking God's will for our lives and, this, and for this broken yet beautiful world, there is no need to look back, no need to look back at what you've left behind, Today, this moment, is sufficient unto itself. Wanting to draw closer to God is eternal life. Amen.